A vegan diet has been shown to upregulate genes that protect against cancer. Anytime you see a nutritional epidemiological study, anything that says, oh, this is linked to that, you know, meat is linked to cancer, or this is associated with that, it, the, the likeliness, the likelihood that that will be an accurate statement is zero to 20% of the time. Vegan diets and lifestyle interventions have been shown to grow telomeres, the caps at the ends of our chromosomes that correlate with our longevity. It's not the fat you eat that becomes the fat in your blood, but the carbohydrates you eat. And vegetarian diets are almost always higher in carbohydrates. More animal protein, more premature death, more plant protein, less premature death. That is just a critical flaw when you're saying, let's assume a vegan vegetarian diet, which we've only had access to that the last 20 to 30, 40 years, is something that we can rely upon for the whole human race um, when it doesn't supply the basic nutrients needed for human life. Tonight's resolution again reads, there is little or no rigorous evidence that vegan vegetarian diets are healthier than diets that include uh, meat, uh, eggs, and cheese. Arguing for the affirmative, Nina Teicholz. Nina... <laughs> Nina, please come to the stage. Uh, sit over there. Yeah. Uh, arguing for the negative, uh, Dr. David Katz. David, please come to the stage. Jane, uh, please close the voting. All right, uh, Nina, uh, you are arguing for the affirmative, so you're up. Please come to the mic. Thanks. Great. Uh, well, I, I feel like I missed out. I didn't go to McDonald's before the debate because I could just stand up here and say, tremendous, and I'd win. That would be it. So, um, well, you know, I'm very excited to be here. I think there's a special uh, frisson of excitement actually in the room tonight because I, I don't know if many of you know, but there's actually sort of a history between um, David Katz and I uh, that's from the past few years. and. Um, and this is the first time that we've met, so that's exciting. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm here because I wrote this book. And when it came out in 2014, um, it was much acclaimed. I had spent nearly a decade of my life di diving into the science and read thousands and thousands of scientific studies. And I got, uh, it was best book of the year by a number of really important outlets and um, lauded by medical journals. And yet, there was this Yale doctor who was writing these terrible things about me. Um, like, he was saying I was only out to sell a book, and that was the only reason I had written what I had written. I, my, my book is basically the central argument is that saturated fats have been unfairly vilified and do not actually cause heart disease. And so, um, so he said that I was only out to write a, uh, uh, <laughs> to sell books like, yeah, good plan, spend a decade of your life to, uh, to write a nonfiction book. Um, but it got worse, um, that I was a parasite of science and um, that I was a fool or a fanatic, that I was a peril, um, or that I lived in a, I was a wing nut living in the basement of my mom. Um, I just want you to know when I lived with my mom, I was allowed to live on the top floor. Um, <laughs> And, um, and then it finally came to being quoted um, in The Guardian as saying I was like an animal unlike anything he'd ever seen before, which really, um, really hurt my feelings. And a number of doctors wrote into the dean of Yale Medical School to say, well, well what is going on here? This is not very professional behavior. And got the reply that, um, that Dr. Katz is not associated. He doesn't teach or he's not a professor at the medical school. And he runs a, a research program at a local county hospital that got the name of Yale some years ago. And so that made me feel better. But I also just want to explain, I've been asked like, by so many people why I would be here tonight. Um, it is hard to be on stage with somebody who's been so uncivil to you. And, I'm, and I guess my answer is, is that I really believe in the science, and I really think it's important. I think these kinds of attacks are, are just not about science. It's so important that we understand and debate the real science. I care so much about it, so that is why I'm here. Um, and uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so what are we debating? We are debating a hypothesis that uh, vegan or vegetarian diets are superior in health 
to diets with, with animal foods in them. Um, in order for a hypothesis to be considered as somewhat true, or we can, we can start to believe in it as truth, it must be supported by rigorous evidence. That's human clinical trials, and those trials must be replicated. And it must not be contradicted by a large body or really very many facts to the contrary, which undermine it. Um, there's a wonderful quote by the biologist Thomas Huxley who said, the, um, a, the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. So we are going to see if there are any of those ugly facts out there tonight. Um, why is this debate so very, very important? Uh, the True Health Initiative is Dr. Katz's uh, foundation, and he says that you know we really everybody really should eat a plant-based, plant-predominant diet, and he says that everybody agrees on this. This is their point that everybody's in sync with this, um, and uh, I think. Dr. Katz and I agree that, the, that, that we are really struggling with the chronic diseases that afflict our country, but there really is dis disagreement about what is the best diet to pre prevent those. So I have to explain to you this really big word now, uh, epidemiology, and even longer, nutritional epidemiology, um, because in order for us to really talk about the science and nutrition, we need to understand what is the science and nutrition. So I'm gonna take you on this little uh, journey. Um, nutritional epidemiology, is when you take a large group of people like this, um, who all look so happy right now, and you ask them a bunch of questions. What do you eat? Do you exercise? Do you take pills? What do you, you know, do you have a nice family life? Do you go to church? And then you follow them over time, and you see who succumbs to disease or eventually death. What kinds of conditions do they get? And so you have many, many income variable, uh, variables, all the things they eat and everything they do in their life, and many, many outcome variables, everything that's possible that could happen to human health. And as a result, and there's all these correlations, like a thicket of correlations. And what happens is you get false positives. Inevitably, there are things that are going to correlate with each other that do not, are not causation. I mean, here we have uh, one of these correlations. Internet use causes breast cancer? I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe sitting in front of the computer all day causes cancer, who knows? But this is a false positive. Here's another one, a false positive whereby if you decrease the amount of margarine that you eat, apparently you can save your marriage. Um, <laughs> That seems cheaper than a marriage counselor. Um, but um, that is uh, unlikely to be a causal link. Epidemiology only shows, it is, shows associations, associations. And nutritional epidemiology is particularly fraught because it depends on people reporting what they ate. So just imagine this. So every six months you get a questionnaire. How many apples did you eat? Uh, on average over the last, you know, six months every week. How many pears? How many, um, how much lasagna? And can you quantify that by cup? And, and, um, and can you, let's hope that that's the, your lasagna is the same recipe as my lasagna in my database back here. Um, and how many people do you think out here, just raise your hand if you might be likely to lie about how much sugar or alcohol that you uh, imbibe? <laughs> right, would. So there's, you know, the science really shows that people not only don't remember what they eat, but they lie about it. Um, they don't mean to, it's just that they don't want to be seen as looking bad, even in an anonymous questionnaire. They don't want to think badly about themselves. So this data is very unreliable. Um, uh, I'm just going to slide over this one. but. Um, that the unreliability of that data is profound, and that is really at the heart of the problem with using nutrition epidemiology. There is a better kind of science called a clinical trial, a, you know, ideally a randomized controlled clinical trial, and that's where I take a group of people like you, and over here, this group, I give you a pill or I give you a diet. And this group over here I, is my control group. I give them a placebo or I give them a control diet. And if you're a big enough group, and I, consume, I can assume that everything else about you is equal, except for the intervention, the pillar of the diet. And at the end of our period, let's say a year, I can decide, let's say you, this group all drops dead from heart attacks. <laughs> I know that it's due to my unfortunate intervention. Um, and that is the kind of science that can show cause and effect. So, when nutritional epidemiological findings are tested in this more rigorous kind of science, a clinical trial, they have been shown to be correct in this one study by a Stanford professor only 20% of the time. In this study, they were, they were correct 0% of the time. So anytime you see a nutritional epidemiological study, anything that says, oh, this is linked to that, 
you know, meat is linked to cancer, or this is associated with that, it, the, the likeliness, the likelihood that that will be an accurate statement is zero to 20% of the time. This latter study that showed that 0% actually looked at all the findings of the, uh, the most influential epidemiological database in the country at Harvard, looked at all their findings. They were the ones who tell us to take various supplements and also to do hormone replacement therapy. Do you remember that? All based on epidemiological findings. Altogether, 52 of these epidemiological findings were studied. Um, and they found that 0% of those could be confirmed in clinical trials. And this is not an idle thing. You remember hormone replacement therapy, millions of women are taking hormone replacement therapy only to find when they did the clinical trial that they had a higher risk of, of having a heart attack. So this is not an idle matter. That is, the, that is why we cannot trust this kind of science. And why, if you look anywhere in the world at systems for grading and understanding science, they will put, uh, they will put in that middle layer, that kind of aqua blue is where all the epidemiology is. And on top of that, in the darker blue, is randomized controlled clinical trials. That's where you start. Regardless of the system you're using, whether it's the system Cochrane from the UK or one called GRADE from, the, from Canada, it's controlled clinical trials that are the gold standard. So uh, just as you would not prescribe a pill to a patient based on an epidemiological study this is linked with that, but we're not sure, 0 to 20% odds that we're right. You would not do that with a diet. So what is the rigorous clinical trial evidence for a vegetarian or a vegan diet? Let's look at this. The US Dietary Guideline Committee in 2015 looked at all of the available trial evidence they could find at the time. And, and from an uh, analysis that we did, we found that 11 of 14 members in that expert committee were actually themselves were, had published in favor of plant-based diets. So we knew that they were, if there were any trials to be found, they would find them. They had an incentive to find them. Uh, they couldn't find any, and they had to rank that evidence at the lowest possible grade that is available for when you have any evidence. So that's the government's um, uh, systematic review. Here's another systematic review of clinical trials and heart disease. They could only find that only 836 people had been tested, which is not very many. And they found that although those trials lowered your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol supposedly, it also lowered your good cholesterol, your HDL, that came down in, in a vegan vegetarian diet. That's a sign of your heart disease risk increasing. And those diets also almost always increase your triglycerides, which are the fatty acids in your blood. Why? Because it's not the fat you eat that becomes the fat in your blood, but the carbohydrates you eat. And vegetarian diets are almost always higher in carbohydrates. Anybody knows this. I was a vegetarian for over 20 years. I avoided meat, red meat, butter, cheese, everything like the plague. And when you're not having meat for dinner or you can't have an egg pie, you're having pasta, grain-based meals, you're having cereals, you're, you're, I used to bake my own bread. You have a high carbohydrate diet and that drives up your triglycerides and that is another sign of your worsening cardiac risk. So in all, this is a mixed outcome, a mixed grade for um, vegan, vegetarian diets and heart disease. What about diabetes? This is the latest, um, consensus statement that came out of the American Diabetes Association, which has always been hostile to low-carb diets, but it's come out saying for the first time, we believe that low-carbohydrate carb restriction is really the best, um, is, is the best course that you can take. And it, um, it, it said that there was not ample evidence, particularly for a vegan or vegetarian diet, and that those diets showed a, a fairly small ability to reduce your average blood glu glucose measures, which is called HbA1c. Um, I just want to go to this. Uh, this is one of the meta-analyses they cited. This is the bigger of the two that they cited. There were only two that were available. And you can see here, this is David Jenkins, who's a vegan vegetarian, who is um, said has on the record as saying he thinks everybody should be vegan vegetarian. This person is somebody who works with an animal activist group. So I just want to show you that there's, this is one of the reasons that we're all so confused, that there's a lot of bias in the literature. But even they could find, oops, um, even they could find very uh, little evidence of any kind of benefit from a vegan vegetarian diet for reducing diabetes. Again, that blood glucose uh, decrease is only 0.29%. By contrast, um, sorry, I have to go through this all again. A recent local carbohydrate trial uh, after one year found a um, 6.3 to 7.6% reduction. 
that is just, I mean, compare that to 0.29% reduction. And, and you know, low carbohydrate diets are not always high in animal foods, but they are definitely, they're definitely much more commonly um, contain animal foods. So that really sort of uh, blows away really any other diet. Uh, what about non-alcohol, alcoholic fatty liver disease? A rising epidemic. Um, we're not sure exactly what causes it, maybe too much fructose, but you can see the diets from this uh, review paper, uh, the diets they single out are either Mediterranean or paleo as being viable ways to combat that disease, but not, again, a vegan or vegetarian diet. So what are the arguments that Dr. Katz uses when he's defending his, um, his point of view? He often talks about the blue zones. Uh, the blue zones, I don't know if you know them, that came from this book. It was the author went around the world and found what he thought were the longest living people, and he, um, he wrote them up in his book. Um, I actually have this book at home, and I looked at it for the first time just last week when I was preparing for the debate, and it was stunning to me that there's no footnotes in it. So you really can't check anything. So it is surprising to cite this um, as your primary resource. Uh, it's because you can't look anything up. But one of the blue zones is one that we all know really well, which is the Okinawans, who are reportedly um, supposed to live very long, and do live, there is a cohort that has been very, very long lived. But I mean, just to give you an example of why it's so hard to trust this kind of evidence, because they did a dietary sample of these people in 1949, when the island was, had they had just, Japan had just lost World War II, the island was occupied by US soldiers, they were not, they were barely feeding their prisoners, and they, um, and, and over 80%, does it say, over 80% had symptoms of, of um, being malnourished. So when you go into a population, you have no idea what these people ate when they were young, or as teenagers, or for the rest of their lives. I mean, you have no idea what made them long-lived. You can't say it was their diet in 1949. That was an exceptional sample. Um, here's another, uh, this is another sort of study that um, Dr. Katz likes to cite of the Tasmanian people in Bolivia. He also a plant-based diet. I just wanted to look at that study a little more closely. It seemed they had very low calcium scores. It's a sign of heart disease. And if you, uh, but if you look at their diet, it turns out there's no pay, there's no information on diet in the paper. It, but they referred to another paper where the diet was taken on only breastfeeding women, and that paper says that. 83% of the women are having um, meat every day. Am I getting it right? Fish every day. And 63% are having meat every day. And even that paper sort of then cites another paper, which, uh, you know, so you're three degrees removed now from getting the real dietary data. So a very tenuous kind of uh, data. I just want to give you one example. I mean, it's like, you know, you can cherry pick certain of these examples, but there are so many counterexamples. This is a study on one million men in India where uh, the southern Indians eating mostly plant fats had heart disease rates seven times higher than the northern Indians eating eight to 19 times more fat, mostly dairy fat. And the southern Indians died 12 years uh, earlier. So I can't go through all my examples now because I'm running out of time. Um, but uh, here's just a couple other facts that contradict this idea that eating more plants will protect against disease. We eat 44% more plants, foods, today than we did in 1970. I took sugar out of there because I didn't think that was fair, but it's still, this is not saying they cause these diseases, but they have done a terrible job of combating them. Let's just say that. And here's animal foods. Um, you can see, whoops, uh, animal foods, I'm sorry, all gone down while obesity and diabetes have increased. So it's very hard to make the argument that these have caused uh, those diseases. What else do you have to ignore in order to believe that vegan vegetarians are, are the best for health? Um, all of human civilization, right? I mean, ever since we were young, uh, we, I mean, ever since the humans have been young, we have eaten meat and dairy. Um, and it's in all of our art, it's everywhere. Um, a British captain, Navy surgeon captain is, is quoted as this one of my favorite quotes saying, it's just ludicrous to believe that a, uh, a modern disease is, um, could be, um, could be blamed on an old-fashioned food. This is just a timeline of history. I mean, you'll see this is where, uh, at the very end here, we start to get access to fruits and vegetables year-round. It's only possible because we, had, we fly them in by plane and train and automobile. I mean, 
people sitting in this room right now in May, we would be like struggling. There'd be no more moldy apples in the barrel. There'd be no more root vegetables. We'd be waiting for June to get our next fresh fruit or vegetable. So um, this has only been possible in the last you know, few decades that we've been able to eat fresh fruits and vegetables year round. Um, so all of these facts contradict the idea that vegan vegetarian diets could be superior for health. Um, and now just a quick word about saturated fats, which are not only in meat but in food. Dr. Katz likes to say that saturated fats, uh, he believes they still cause heart disease. These are some of the most tested fats in the world. Huge clinical trials on 25,000 people, um, and most of them inpatient, therefore highly controlled, and the results are having no effect of saturated fats on cardiovascular total mortality, just none. Um, uh, so this hypothesis has been tested more than any hy hypothesis in the history of nutrition and disease, and the results have been null. This is a chart you're just going to have to take a graph, a picture of, and I can explain it to you later. But it shows that for all the hard outcomes, death uh, and cardiovascular mortality, all the review papers find no effect of saturated fats. Um, OK, I've got a minute left, so I'm going to skip all these slides um, and just say um, this is the state of the evidence um, on the vegan vegetarian diet. Um, it remains a hypothesis. It has not been rigorously tested in, in randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, human evolutionary history does not support it. And there was a great deal of contradictory evidence. So it is now incumbent, I think, upon Dr. Katz to show that there is indeed uh, rigorous clinical trial evidence that supports the idea that vegan or vegetarian diets are superior to health than diets with animal foods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Dr. David Katz, arguing for the negative. Take it away, David. Slides, Gene? Uh, Brett, thank you. Thanks very much, Gene. OK. Good evening, folks. So this, exactly this, and only this, is what we all agreed to see debated here this evening. This is the resolution. There is little or no rigorous evidence that vegetarian vegan diets are healthier than diets that include meat, eggs, and dairy. The first person that I invited to join me here this evening after my wife, who's here, as well as two of my Brooklynite daughters, was Mark Bittman. Uh, this was because Mark and I did a couple pieces together recently in New York Magazine on diet and health, trying to make sense of the science. And we're writing a book together now, and it's nearly done, and I thought it would be helpful for Mark to sit in and listen to this exchange. But Mark wrote back to me right away, and the enviable bastard said, I can't come, I'll be in Bermuda. I, I don't know that these guys are in Bermuda, but they're wearing Bermuda shorts. Anyway, after telling me, I can't come, I'll be in Bermuda, he went on to say, you do realize that resolution is a sand trap. And I wrote back and said, uh, yeah. So how much is little and who decides? What exactly is rigorous and who gets to tell whom? What is the operational definition of healthier? Uh, actually, these arrows are slightly out of place. So what exactly are the ve ve vegan vegetarian diets? We're talking about what is healthier, and most importantly in that arrow, so we have a formatting issue here, but that's supposed to land on include. What does include mean? Is that eight times a day or once every eight months? So yes, it's a sand trap, uh, but I knew that coming into it. But the, the resolution specifically, and I didn't choose it, I had no input into the wording here, I just accepted the invitation. The resolution is a negative assertion. It asserts an absence of evidence. And so while I am trying to demonstrate the existence of evidence, my counterpart has to demonstrate an absence of evidence. There is little or no rigorous evidence, and proving a negative is an impossible standard. Even if I fail to show you any rigorous evidence, there might be some somewhere. We haven't proved that there is none, and that's the job. So John Oliver said, impossible to prove a negative. So yes, this is my situation tonight. I readily concede that. However, I think my counterpart situation looks more like this. Uh, the job is to prove a complete absence of evidence. So we'll see how that plays out. I hope these arrows do land in the right place up here. So uh, the, the issue then, 
we need to discipline is what do we mean by vegetarian? Gene, I think you're in the way, if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, what do we mean by vegetarian vegan diets, and what do we mean by diets that include meat, eggs, and dairy? And I think we have to discipline the resolution just a little bit, because this plus this is vegan, and throw this in and it's vegetarian. <laughs> and I didn't come here to debate this nonsense, and I trust you didn't come here to hear this debated. It only makes sense to have this debate if we're talking about sensible, balanced, whole, complete, reasonable vegetarian and vegan diets. And frankly, I don't think the debate makes much sense either if by diets that include meat, eggs, or dairy, we need an optimal plant-based diet that rarely includes a bit of venison, or an optimal plant-based diet that rarely includes a bit of wild salmon, or an optimal plant-based diet that occasionally includes Greek yogurt, right? I think what we need to compare here is diets that are built out of plants and diets that routinely include meat, eggs, and dairy. And by the way, the resolution doesn't say or, it says and. So I think that's the relevant comparison. That's what I came here to talk about. Now, even accepting the invitation under those circumstances, I'd like to point out that this is not an argument I think makes any sense at all. Because there are good and bad vegan and vegetarian diets, and frankly, I don't necessarily think if we just focus on human health that an optimal vegan diet is demonstrably better than an optimal Mediterranean diet. So basically, I've been asked to come here and fight left-handed. And like Inigo Montoya, I am not left-handed. Uh, but I accepted the terms of the exchange, so I will fight left-handed. So the resolution, again, is that there's little or no rigorous evidence that vegetarian vegan diets are healthier than diets that include meat, eggs, or dairy. So, and again, these arrows are falling in odd places. So let's agree, I'm not sure where that one's supposed to go, but I think it's vegetarian vegan diets. Let's agree we mean sensible, complete vegetarian vegan diets. Healthier, let's agree we mean less premature death, less chronic disease, and improvement in well-validated biomarkers that are predictive of those. And let's agree that we mean include is routine. It's not very rare inclusion of Greek yogurt. It's routine inclusion of meat, eggs, and dairy. That makes the debate interesting. And then we can shift our focus to the core of it, because this is actually not a debate, folks, about dietary details. Those haven't really been specified. It's a debate about evidence. The core of this debate is little, rigorous, and no. So if we accept the resolution as what's being debated here this evening, no is wrong if I can show you any, little is wrong if I can show you a bunch, and rigorous, well, who gets to decide? Well, there are objective standards for rigorous evidence. Some were already mentioned here this evening. Grade is a scoring system for systematic reviews. Most of the scientific community signs off on the fact that meta-analyses, systematic reviews, and um, randomized controlled trials are at the pinnacle of evidence. BMJ pretty much agrees with this. They have their own spin on it. The Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University pretty much agrees. But since I am obligated to stand up here this evening and defend to you this notion of rigorous evidence, I thought we should voir dire me. I'm essentially the, the expert witness, right? Am I qualified to say I think evidence is rigorous? So I have been asked to do review articles on diet and nutrition for the peer-reviewed literature. I've authored multiple editions of a leading nutrition textbook for healthcare professionals used in medical education. I've co-authored multiple editions of a leading epidemiology textbook. The fifth is in production right now. This has been translated into a bunch of languages. I'm not sure what all these languages are, to be honest with you. Uh, written a textbook on evidence-based medicine. I'm gonna talk to you this evening about randomized controlled trials. I have conducted and published these multiple times. I have critiqued, critiqued the data analysis in other randomized control trials. I'm going to talk to you about systematic reviews. I have conducted and published these. I'm going to talk to you about meta-analyses. I have conducted and published these. And I have invented research methods. We'll talk about research methods. I've actually invented methods of evidence synthesis, most notably evidence mapping. This goes back to 2003. This is a widely used measure to assess the quality of evidence in diverse medical fields. We actually have a new invention uh, related to evidence synthesis called HELM, Hierarchies of Evidence Applied to Lifestyle Medicine. This paper is currently under review at Medical Research Methodology. So I have to show you some evidence to refute none. I have to show you a bunch to refute little. 
and I humbly submit that I'm well qualified to adjudicate rigorous, but particularly if I cleave to objective standards, like for example, randomized control trials. So let's just talk about randomized control trials of vegetarian vegan diets. And as I do this and I pull up these text boxes, so significant reductions in lipids and inflammatory markers with the portfolio diet, that's a vegan diet. Every one of these randomized control trials I'm about to show you compares a ve vegan or vegetarian diet to an omnivorous diet. And in every case, what's in the blue box is verbatim from the paper. So I'm not editorializing here. So basically, a vegan portfolio diet lowers lipids as effectively as a statin, and the omnivorous counterpart diet did not work as well. This study shows that a vegetarian diet was more effective than a non-vegetarian Mediterranean diet at lowering LDL cholesterol. This, and again, all randomized controlled trials of various sizes. Cardiovascular risk reduction was optimized by a high carbohydrate, meaning a high plant food. By the way, carbohydrate is plant food. All plant foods are carbohydrate sources. So there was a better effect on lowering cardiac risk markers with a plant-based low glycemic diet than a meat-based low glycemic diet. And again, it's a little hard to see from this angle, so forgive the turning. TMAO is trimethylamine and oxide. It's a potent atherogenic metabolite. This randomized trial of multiple diets showed that the only way to reduce TMAO was to take meat out of the diet. So when meat was replaced with plants, TMAO plummeted. This randomized trial shows that a low-fat vegan diet improved glycemia and plasmid lipids more than conventional diets recommended for diabetes by the American Diabetes Association. This randomized trial showed improvement in insulin sensitivity. Beta cells are where insulin is produced um, through a low-fat plant-based diet compared to an omnivorous diet. This randomized control trial showed that uh, reducing saturated fat intake um, is associated with reducing intrahepatic fat. Um, fat in the liver leads to insulin resistance. This was really interesting. It was an overfeeding study. Saturated fat produced more fat in the liver than overfeeding the same number of calories from sugar or anything else. This randomized control trial compared, it was a feeding study, basically a hamburger versus a vegan meal of comparable calories. There was impairment in gut hormone responses and increased oxidative stress after the hamburger, but not the vegan counterpart. This randomized control trial shows vegan, vegetarian diets all better for reducing the dietary inflammatory index, a potent marker of chronic disease risk. This, card, this randomized trial shows in patients with coronary disease, a vegan diet lowers uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, a potent inflammatory marker. This diet shows that diet quality scores increase significantly on a vegan diet, but not counterparts. That's important because these diet quality scores, the AHEI, alternate healthy eating, I realize this is a lot, I'm sorry. Um, these in turn correlate with all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. This randomized trial shows greater weight loss in the vegan group compared to the omnivorous group. This randomized trial shows more, again, weight loss compared to an NCEP, that's the National Cholesterol Education Program. This randomized trial shows plant protein produces particular improvements in body composition during weight loss. This study showed that plant-based protein is as good at controlling hunger and satiety as animal protein during a weight loss experience. Another randomized trial, reduction in intramuscular fat with the vegan but not the omnivorous diet. Another randomized trial, mean BMI reduction greater with whole food plant-based. These researchers go on to say they think this is the greatest weight loss seen at 6 and 12 months when you aren't specifically restricting calories. Another randomized trial, perhaps the most famous, Dean Ornish, randomized trial, patients with coronary disease. This was a randomized trial. I don't know if people realize this. But here, a plant-based diet caused actual regression of coronary atherosclerosis. That's shown on top. The bottom images are PET scans. They show cardiac metabolic function. The orange is normal. Left is before, right is after the lifestyle intervention with a plant-based diet. These images show the effects of the same plant-based dietary intervention. This is from the Cleveland Clinic. And the Ornish study went out five years. And at five years, the folks who had this plant-based diet intervention they had further regression of their coronary plaque. The control group had twice as many cardiac events. That's MI, sudden cardiac death, admissions to the hospital for heart failure. 
And we don't need to decide that this is rigorous evidence. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have already done that for us. They've concluded that this program meets the intensive cardiac rehab program requirements set forth by Congress, and Medicare reimburses for this program of plant-based nutrition as cardiac rehab and as an alternative to coronary bypass surgery. This interesting randomized trial shows improvement in mental health with a vegan diet as compared to omnivorous controlled diet, depression, anxiety, et cetera. This was a multi-site um, intervention at work sites. This is just a sampling of randomized controlled trials. There are many more. It's already too much to show you. I apologize for the pace of this, but it's the nature of the enterprise. Now let's look at systematic reviews and meta-analyses. I'll go through these very quickly. So these are exclusively meta-analyses, systematic reviews. Most of them are meta-analyses of randomized control trials. Some of them are meta-analyses of cohort studies and some a combination of the two. So there is some variation in the mix here. I'm just trying to carefully watch the time. So this shows an association in meta-analysis between vegetarian diets and lower blood pressure than with omnivorous diets. Omnivorous diets, of course, diets containing meat, eggs, and dairy are the control in every instance. Uh, this meta-analysis shows vegetarian is associated with lower levels of high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This meta-analysis shows reductions in multiple markers of inflammation, including C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, leukocyte concentrations. This meta-analysis shows lower mean concentrations of serum cholesterol on vegetarian vegan diets. Another meta-analysis, substituting meat with high-quality plant protein associated with favorable changes in blood lipids and lipoproteins. Again, these are mostly meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. Another one, vegan diet is associated with more favorable cardiometabolic profile. Another meta-analysis, the portfolio diet reduces the 10-year risk of coronary heart disease. This is a vegan diet. Another meta-analysis, vegetarians have significantly lower ischemic heart disease and mortality. Another meta-analysis, lower risk of colorectal cancer in the vegetarian and vegan diets. Another meta-analysis, inverse association with vegan diets and diabetes risk. Another meta-analysis, um, diets that produce the highest scores, the, these various measures of diet quality, have the lowest levels of all-cause premature death cardiovascular disease, et cetera, and the highest score on these measures is a high-quality vegan diet. And another meta-analysis, significant protective effect versus the incidence and mortality from ischemic heart disease and cancer. Okay, just a sampling, all right? It is just a sampling. All right, now, I want to argue, so I, I'm a scientist, I've done this my whole life. I want to argue that although these are the objective standards of high-quality evidence, I don't know that they necessarily are the most robust evidence, but let me first ask you a question. How many of you would agree that in order to know something is true, not believe it's true or wish it's true or hope it's true, to know it's true, you need evidence that it's true, to know something's true? It's a little hard to see, right? To know something's true, you need evidence it's true. And how many of you would agree that to know something is true with a very near certain level of confidence, you need rigorous evidence that it's true. You're being cautious, right? You know something with near certainty. Can you know it with near certainty without evidence? Okay. How many of you know if I toss this apple up, be honest, it's going to fall back down and not float away? So I guess the evidence was very strong. Was it a randomized control trial? Was it a meta-analysis? See, I think science is being abused and misused. I think the most robust evidence is remarkably consistent patterns at massive scale on obvious display. And so, frankly, we can know a lot from observation. Yes, we need randomized controlled trials to populate GATS. And later in the evening, if there's time, I'll tell you the specific role of RCTs. They are not the be all end all. They don't answer every question. So you knew what was gonna happen to this apple. It's just the consistency of the pattern. So yes, I will talk about the blue zones because there are five identified blue zones where people live to be 100 and don't get chronic disease, and they're very diverse. But if we were to plot their diets on a scale from animal food predominant to plant food predominant, they would cluster at the plant food predominant end. They range from mostly plants to all plants, and yes, that's important. And then there's a lot of other evidence. So gene expression, a vegan diet has been shown to upregulate genes that protect against cancer. This is a whole body of literature all on its own. Vegan diets and lifestyle interventions have been shown to grow telomeres, the caps at the ends of our chromosomes that correlate with our longevity. Uh, the higher the intake of dietary fat from animal sources, the higher the all-cause mortality. 
the higher the fat in our diet from plant sources, the lower the all-cause mortality, exactly the same with protein, more animal protein, more premature death, more plant protein, less premature death. And frankly, the observational evidence just goes on and on, and I'm not gonna characterize all these, right? Enough, enough, because my, my only job is to show you that there isn't no evidence and there isn't little evidence and a lot of this evidence is rigorous. So on and on and on and on and on. Lancet study, 195 countries, more premature death all around the world with more intake of highly processed food, which is also bad. Not all plant food is good, obviously, but more meat and processed meat, lower rates of premature death around the world with more intake of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Copy that. The common denominator in all of the literature on lifestyle interventions is plant-based nutrition. And while you may think I'm showing you lots of studies tonight, Actually, I can't. I can only show you a small sampling because there's just too much literature on this topic. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So there is little or no rigorous evidence that vegetarian vegan diets are healthier than diets that include meat, eggs, and dairy. Well, or no is clearly wrong because there's some. Little is wrong because there is a shit whack. And uh, for those of you who are quantitatively punctilious, a shit whack is 1.2 American shit loads. <laughs> and it is objectively rigorous evidence, including but not limited to multiple RCTs, meta-analyses, systematic reviews. Thank you. So now we're going to get the two rebuttals, and you'll be ready for your questions. And I, uh, I just want it clear in terms of the way I do things is, yes, I wrote the resolution, but both sides are given the opportunity to read and approve the resolution, and indeed, uh, both sides did. Uh, and uh, I, I now bring you Nina for, the, uh, for, for her rebuttal. Thanks, Jean. Um, OK, well, there's. Uh, obviously too many studies to even respond to here, but I, let's, let's start with the apple. Um, okay, so every study that Dr. Katz showed you after the apple was uh, an association study. That means it's an epidemiological study. That means the, the odds that those studies would be correct are zero to 20%. I just want you to remember that it is, um, it is, is zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is still zero, no matter how many of them there are. When he was going through before the Apple, the systematic reviews and the meta-analyses, I counted 11 of them he showed us. Uh, 10 of those were on observational epidemiological studies. Again, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, a lot. You can show a lot of slides, a lot of data, but if it's not reliable, it is the tragic, uh, the tragic problem of data not being able to prove cause and effect. And we've seen, we've seen it through hormone replacement therapy, we've seen it through being told that we should not eat cholesterol, and avoiding eggs and avoiding you know, egg yolks and shellfish and then that being wrong. Those are the tragedies that happen when you rely on lesser evidence. You cannot add it up and have it be anything more than what it is, which is unreliable zeros. I like the point about the apple. Uh, I think it's clever, it is true. We should trust our senses on certain things. And what do we see when we look around us in America today? We see out of control epidemics of obesity and diabetes and heart disease and cancer and fatty liver disease. That is what we can see with our own eyes without anybody telling us. And we have, since 1970, been eating more and more and more plants, foods, and fewer and fewer and fewer animal foods. So that is something that just is some, an observation we can all see. We have tried really hard to follow these plant-based, more grain guidelines and that has not worked out for us. Um, I want to just, uh, th there's a number of clinical trials that um, Dr. Katz did show um, before he went on to the systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and I think that um, one thing that's really important to say is that the reason that you look at meta-analyses and systematic reviews is that they are able to sift through all of those clinical trials and make judgments about them. 
many of those clinical trials that he cited, you know, some of them aren't randomized. Some of them um, are, you know, a cholesterol-lowering diet is not necessarily a diet that's a vegan diet, or you have problems. There are all kinds of criteria that go into deciding whether a clinical trial is a good trial and, and should be included or is not, does not meet your adherence standards. That is why I only presented reviews by credible bodies, and I only presented systematic reviews of randomized controlled clinical trials. And so even as I said, when the Dietary Guideline Committee went around to uh, looking for its, um, its it randomized controlled trials for the vegetarian vegan diet, they couldn't find any. Okay, one final note on the Ornish trial, which is the one that supposedly showed the regression of heart disease. That was one trial on 41 men um, who were put on, some of them were put on his uh, vegetarian diet um, it was a multifactorial intervention, so anything, any, it was included cessation of smoking and more exercise and yoga and meditation and supplements, so you don't know if there were good outcomes, if, if, as he said, if, if that was due to uh, the diet or any of these other interventions. Um, on his trial, the good cholesterol, the HDL, declined, as it always does in a vegetarian diet, was a sign of increasing cardiovascular risk on his trial two people died in the intervention group versus one in the control group, um, which is something he doesn't often advertise. But that is a, um, well, in certain parts of the nutrition world, you would call that a 100% increase in mortality. Um, <laughs> so um, another, you know, I, I can't go through all of them. Several of the trials that he showed were by Neil Barnard, who is an animal rights activist, who starts with the point of view that we should not be eating animals at all. And that is his starting point scientifically. Um, and his study that he, uh, when he showed TMAO, which is um, something he said he could only fix by eating less meat, um, actually it's much, much higher in vegetables, so reducing uh, vegetables is better for reducing TMAO. I just want to say it's just a very highly selective group of trials there, and you really have to rely on review papers that have done a good job of weeding through good and bad trials. Um, and when you do that, you find there's little or no rigorous evidence for the vegan vegetarian diet. So to be clear, Brett, I'll count on you to get, get us started here. To be clear, um, you know, nobody advocates for eating junk. And actually, there's been no increase over time in intake of fruits and vegetables in the United States. So you know, if we're talking about multicolored marshmallows as part of a complete breakfast, yeah, that's gone up. But there's more than one way to eat badly. And again, Brett, have we got the slides? You got them here? OK, so what we're debating, uh, and by the way, all the trials I showed you were randomized control trials. Um, I, and I, you know, I don't know if anyone here gets to decide, OK, it was a randomized control trial, but I didn't like the author, so it doesn't qualify as rigorous evidence. I, I don't think it works that way. Um, so they were all randomized control trials, and most of the meta-analyses were of randomized control trials. And as I mentioned, some included observational studies. So this is the resolution again. Um, but are there studies that can show that eating meat is better? And, and how is that even possible? W what if vegetarian, vegan diets, or plant-predominant diets are unquestionably better? How can, how can it ever look otherwise? Well, there are three reasons. Comparison, conflagration, and context. Comparison is key. This study by Lee et al. looked at 100,000 people over 30 years and then carved out the ones who reduced their intake of saturated fat from meat and dairy and ask the question that is routinely neglected, what did they eat instead? Well, if they substituted refined carbs and added sugar, it was a sideways move. They had the same rates of heart disease. There is more than one way to eat badly, and the American public is committed to exploring them all. That's sort of the takeaway <laughs> message here. This is, seriously, OK? Um, however, if they replaced saturated fat from animal sources with unsaturated Fat from plant sources, rates of heart disease plummeted. If they replaced these calories with whole grain calories, rates of heart disease plummeted. Right? So the instead of what question, comparison is key. The other issue is conflagration. It's so easy to create a straw man and then set fire to it. So a lot of these studies that suggest eating meat is good 
Well, I told you, I don't think we want to talk about the Coca-Cola cotton candy vegan diet, but some people do. And so a lot of the studies you hear about, oh, this was a randomized controlled trial. We randomly assigned people to an omnivorous diet and a vegan diet. You think bias doesn't figure into that? And by the way, the fact that you can hear these randomized controlled trials were biased, well, that's, that's a precaution that's universal, right? Ah, so they can be biased. So maybe we need other forms of evidence too. Because if this is the vegan assignment, it's a straw man. And if this is the vegetarian diet, it's a straw man. And then context is key. Sometimes eating meat is a really good thing. This poor child has kwashiorkor, it's protein deficiency. This doesn't happen in the US, but it still happens in the Sudan and other places around the world. What is good to eat is totally dependent on epidemiologic context. We eat too much meat. Eating more vegetables and fruits and whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds would be better because of the nature of our diets and the nature of our epidemiology. But no amount of evidence regarding the existence of B, evidence, say, for meat, can prove the non-existence of A. And again, my job here was to argue there is a shit whack of rigorous evidence supporting vegetarian and vegan diets. Uh, as in fact there is. Now there's debate about what constitutes high quality evidence. We could spend time going into the weeds here, but I'll simply tell you for now, RCTs have both strengths and weaknesses. There is no single definitive source of high quality evidence, but no, we're not clueless about the basic care and feeding of homo sapiens. If we were, if our science were really as useless as some contend, we'd have no basis to know whether jelly beans or pinto beans were better for us. Science is a set of tools that can be used well or badly, and frankly, we spend a lot of time using tools badly. I do RCTs, they have limitations. We have no RCTs to prove the harms of smoking, and it was the merchants of doubt from the tobacco industry who made hay with that for years. You don't always need RCTs, and you can ask bad questions, like which step in a long hike is the active ingredient? We don't do that in exercise research. We do just that kind of silly thing in some nutrition research. I don't know why, but it does get done. So frankly, we have an aggregation of diverse sources of evidence. They all point in the same general direction. Plant predominant to plant exclusive diets produce more years in life, more life in years. There isn't no evidence. There isn't little evidence. There's a lot of evidence, and much of it is rigorous by absolutely any standard. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we uh, now go to the Q and A portion of the uh, of the uh, evening. Uh, so please line up with your questions uh, at any time. If either of you want to ask each other a question, you can do so. I want to start for a moment uh, exercising the moderator's prerogative and ask you each a question. Uh, question for you, uh, Nina Teicholz. Uh Is there any uh, of the, the sort of evidence that you say is rigorous? Is there any uh, controlled uh, rigorous trial, uh, randomized trial evidence that you could cite uh, on behalf of your uh, contention having to do with meat, uh, any evidence that you could cite that, uh, that, that meat uh, diets are, uh, are healthier than plant-based diets? Um, yeah, I mean, there's quite a bit of, clin of a clinical trial information on, I mean, any time you compare a diet that has some animal foods in it to a vegan or vegetarian diet, and that has, there's only a handful of those studies where they do compare them, um, depending on, it really depends on the outcomes, but there's, um, there is, uh, and especially if you are, if it's meat and animal foods and, and it's high quality and they're reducing carbohydrates, they always perform better in terms of their cardiovascular outcomes, their weight loss outcomes, their ability to control glucose control. That's why you see the American Diabetes Association um, at, uh, uh, um, selecting that, the, the, that dietary pattern. So the, the clinical trials on meat um, specifically are, um, there's two systematic reviews of clinical trials on meat that I know of that show that cardiovascular outcomes are, are improved. Um, one of them looked at 0.5 ounces or servings of meat per day and showed increased benefits, cardiovascular benefits for eating the meat versus not eating the meat. Um, and there is one other review on cardiovascular outcomes that also showed that meat was beneficial, looked better for cardiovascular outcomes. Thank you. Uh, David, you want to comment on the question, on the answer? You want to comment? 
Uh, well, at least peripherally. So, you know, again, I think we established at the beginning and both said very similar things about what constitutes rigorous evidence. I get the sense that's been turned into a slippery slope. It's rigorous unless I don't like the study. Uh, you know, I think we ought to honor the standards that are in play. What I'd like to refer back to, Gene, if I may, is the fact that I'm, I'm fighting left-handed here this evening and I am not left-handed. So my fa many of my favorite long-term randomized trials are about reducing meat intake. So you know, again, vegetarian vegan diet studies is a very small slice. How do you improve the health of a population that eats too much highly processed food and gets an excess of saturated fat? And by the way, that's a simple-minded notion that saturated fat is bad. You know what's bad? Imbalance is bad. If you had no saturated fat in your diet and added some, it would be fine. If you already have too much and add more, it's bad. We're just prone to an excess. One of my favorite studies, um, this is a multi-country randomized control trial, is the Lyon Diet Heart Study. This was a randomized trial throughout countries of Europe where people who had already had a myocardial infarction were randomly assigned to their customary diet, so a northern European diet, which by the way is much better than the typical glow-in-the-dark junk we eat here in the United States. So it wasn't optimal, but yeah, it wasn't all franken food either. And the intervention diet was a Mediterranean diet that systematically shifted them from animal foods to plant foods and shifted their fat intake from the saturated fat that's concentrated in meat and dairy to more unsaturated fat, notably the oleic acid that predominates in olive oil, but also fat from nuts and seeds, avocado, fish and seafood in lieu of beef and terrestrial animals. Uh, and there was a 70% reduction in the rate of recurrent MI over the multi-year span of the study. Really quite stunning. Now, I couldn't cite that this evening because I was boxed into vegetarian and vegan. But the bigger argument here is what would improve your health? What would improve the health of the American public? Is it eating more meat, eggs, and, and cheese? Or is it eating more fruits and vegetables? And the evidence there is overwhelming and frankly incontrovertible that it's eating more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds. But you, you, do, you do advocate the plant-based diet, though. Well, I, I advocate a diet that's mostly. Uh, you're asking my, you know, that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't the resolution. What well, I think it's relevant advocate, to the resolution. But, but yeah. Yeah. I, I personally advocate diets for, for human health. Mostly that's plants. Yeah. yeah, diets that are mostly comprised of minimally processed whole fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lentils, yeah. nuts, and seeds, plain water when thirsty. Uh, you, you wanted to comment, Nina, ask David a question? Go ahead, Nina. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yes. I just want to respond to just a couple of things that are inaccurate. The Lyon, first of all, the Lyon Diet Heart Trial, it was, it was not a multi-country study. It was only in Lyon. And it was specifically to look at a kind of margarine they had made up that was um, uh, uh, was linoleic acid, and they um, and it was a study where they did very little. It was very poor in terms of there was actually very little difference between the two groups in terms of the dietary intake, and it was. It was not a study looking at a, a plant predominant versus a more animal predominant. It was mainly to look at this effect of this margarine that they were interested in because they were interested in the so-called Mediterranean diet with olive oil. But I want to also increase, uh, it, just correct two other things you said when you said we haven't increased fruits and vegetables in this country. Since 1970, we've increased our consumption of fruits by 35% and our consumption of vegetables by between 20 and 25%. And that I went to look into that because I was curious, like you, well, what are they talking about? Do they mean ketchup? You know, neither of us, I think, are talking about or, or, or in good faith about a, a junk food vegan diet. And actually, the greatest increase in the vegetables that we eat, a 433% increase, is in leafy greens that Americans are eating more of, which are supposed to be the kinds of vegetables that we're supposed to eat. And there is nothing. Uh, so we do eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, and just a final thing I want to correct is this idea that saturated fat is synonymous with meat. The foods that have the highest concentration in saturated fats are plant foods. That's coconut oil and palm oil. We use. We have a lot of us. We all eat palm oil in all of our packaged foods. That's where we we get. Um, they're all made with uh, palm oil because it's a stable fat. So, it, it's it's incorrect to say that saturated fat is synonymous with red meat and or in dairy. That's just I, I, that's just an inaccurate well, statement. Well, let's set aside the saturated fat question. I, I I wanted to. I actually Nina alluded to the question I I wanted to put to you, David, which is has come up, which is only this: uh, Isn't there 
evidence that that there has been noticeable improvement in the in in the American diet. Uh, per capita consumption of meat is down. Per capita consumption of sugar is down. Per capita consumption of fruit and ve vegetables is up. So, uh, are you saying there has been no improvement, or do you not do you acknowledge that there has been data showing uh, tangible statistical improvement? And if so, wouldn't you want to look for uh, tangible improvements in health as a result of that improvement? That's my question. Okay, I'll answer yeah. your question, yeah. Gene. Uh, but but first, uh, everything we just heard about the Leon Diet Heart Study is inaccurate, and you're going to have to pull the okay. papers yourself from the peer-reviewed literature to check that out. Please refer to the peer-reviewed literature, everybody. <laughs> so and and then we'll follow and then, up and, and then, exchange a and bibliography, then, and then let's address the question. So um, yeah. there has actually using the objective measures of diet quality over very recent years, and and. Thank goodness, and frankly, people, I think it's because we've run out of new and innovative ways to eat badly. Um, there has been a slight improvement in diet quality. I, I think part of what is fueling that is at long last an interest in this notion of whole foods and the idea that the less processed, the better. And, and so they're objectively measured. There's been a very slight uh, improvement in diet quality. This was reported by the same unreliable folks at Harvard that are responsible for a lot of the research we heard is useless. But I guess we trust them when we like their outcomes. So there's been a slight, a slight improvement in measures of diet quality. Um, I've looked at data from N. Haynes, uh, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey conducted by the CDC. I cannot find evidence there that we have increased fruits and vegetables as a proportion of calories. If we quant qualify refined grains as a source of vegetable intake, obviously that's gone up. Um, if we think of fried potatoes as a vegetable, and by the way, ketchup and marinara sauce on a slice of pizza qualifies as vegetables under the US federal guidelines. So theoretically, we're told we're increasing our intake of vegetables. A lot of it's that. The, the other important thing is that the entire food supply is booby-trapped to be addictive. Michael Moss, a Pulitzer Prize winner, has written about that. And so our total intake of food has gone up, and total calories have gone up. And by the way, our total intake of fat never went down. It's just that fat as a percent of calories went down a little bit because our total calorie intake went up. And this is pretty well documented, again, by N. Haynes and other sources. No, no, no per capita. I thought it was a per capita reduction in, in uh, consumption of red meat and per capita consumption of sugar. The, no? Yeah, well, sugar, sugar has been going up, sadly, until quite recently. It's red meat. a little bit. Red, red meat has gone down. And we have shifted from plant-based, uh, from, from animal-based fats to plant-based fats. So two quick comments about that, yeah. and then I'll wrap up. Yeah. So, you know, frankly, yes, there has been a slight improvement in diet quality, and there has been a slight decline in the rates of major chronic disease, in particular cardiovascular disease, associated with this trend to eat a bit less meat and eat a bit more animal products, uh, plant products. However, um, this issue of saturated fat from multiple sources is true. Historically, we got our saturated fat from meat and dairy. As people cut back on meat and dairy, sadly, they don't start eating more lentils and broccoli. They start eating highly processed food made with palm oil, which is a highly saturated tropical oil. Maybe better than animal fats for human health, but that's very contentious, probably not and frankly quite devastating for the rainforest in Borneo, which are being cut down to make palm oil plantations, and ultimately that's bad for us too. So yes, sources of saturated fat have shifted over time, uh, but historically the preponderance of saturated fat in the diets, especially of Americans, has been from meat and dairy. Yes, there's saturated fat in coconut, but come on folks, how much coconut do you actually eat? Right? I mean, so it's just not a major source. It is a source. It caught on as a popular cooking oil for a while, and then the blush is off that rose. But most of the saturated fat in the American diet has historically been, and frankly remains, meat and dairy. All right, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, uh, please, uh, I don't see you out there, but if, uh, who's ever online? No, you have to be online at the mic. Uh, you're down there, okay. Please, please state your question as a question. Don't tell us who you are, just ask your question. Uh, my question is for Dr. Katz. Um, how does your diet deal with the presence of anti-nutrients in plants, like oxalates, phytates, et cetera? Excellent question. So again, it, this is not my diet. I, I'm not sell, selling any diet here. I, you know, I'm here talking about plant 
predominant in plant exclusive diets because that's the resolution we agreed to. So you know, there, there, a lot's been made, particular of late, by this guy Gundry, uh, who wrote the Plant Paradox. And there are anti-metabolites in plants, and in particular, he talks about lectins, but we could pick anything else out, right? So you mentioned several others. You realize that oxygen is one of the more potent human toxins known? Yeah. You know that. If you breathe pure oxygen, you'll be dead in about 72 hours. Um, it's a real problem when we're taking care of patients in the intensive care unit. I'll spare you the gory details, but titrating oxygen can be a real challenge. Um, so therefore, there is an anti-respirant in the air in this room. I recommend you all hold your breath. See, who cares? Okay, so pure oxygen is toxic. There's oxygen in the air. Actually, some of it's good for us, and we need to breathe. So really the question is what happens to people who eat the foods? I think one of the great tragedies in all of this discourse on the topic of nutrition and human health is the fixation on isolated parts as opposed to the whole. People don't eat nutrients, they eat foods. What happens to people who eat a diet rich in vegetables, fruits, beans, lentils, beans and lentils, legumes in particular concentrated sources of these lectins that Gundry tells us to fear? Um, in intervention trials and at the level of whole populations observed over generations, and, and if I may, just for a second quickly, you are not going to have ever a randomized control trial that tells you what happens to somebody over their entire lifespan. You cannot randomly assign newborns to a diet and expect them to adhere for to 80 years. If, if we don't derive some of what we need to know from observational epidemiology, most of what is most important will never be known. What happens over entire lifespan? Does this add years to life? Does it add life to years? But both intervention trials in the short term, randomized control trials, meta-analyses, population studies, observational epidemiology, and ethnography of entire populations over the span of generations, which no RCT can ever do, show that these foods, with remarkable consistency, pretty much that much consistency, are associated with more years in life, more life in years. So who gives a damn if there are anti-metabolites in the food? Um, yeah, you want to comment, Arena? Do you want to ask question? Okay, next question, please. My question is also for Dr. Katz. Uh, when observing the different trials, uh, specifically comparing the omnivore diets to the vegetarian and vegan diets, uh, I can't help but wonder uh, when Looking at the, the the meat products and the dairy products that the omnivores were eating, uh, was the quality controlled as far as the processing goes? Ergo, another way to ask the question is, were the vegetarians and vegans eating very high quality plant products? And meanwhile, the omnivores were eating McDonald's burgers and other very highly processed foods that are just generally unhealthy. Thank you for a beautiful question. Insightful, honest. And, and what I can tell you is sadly, and, and you know this is, this is why, no, we cannot rely on any one study. And no single RCT will ever give us definitive truth. And in science, what we rely on is the weight of evidence from multiple sources. And this kind of careful looking under the hood is required. So I, I pointed out to you from the perspective that I'm arguing this evening, the danger of a straw man, right? So if I want to show that eating meat is better than a vegan diet, all I need to do is to design a study of a truly awful vegan diet. So Coca-Cola and cotton candy is the vegan diet, and frankly, anything's better than that. Exactly the same in the opposite direction. So if you are a vegan ideologue, you can design an RCT that compares that to a really bad omnivorous study. I tried when I curated RCTs that I showed you here this evening to select studies of high quality, and even if the researchers were biased, to look at the details of the methods to make sure the methods weren't biased, that they didn't set this up. So in many cases, the comparison diets I showed you were the National Cholesterol Education Program recommendation, so it's a high quality omnivorous diet. The American Diabetes recommendation, high quality omnivorous diet, um, and, and a high quality Mediterranean omnivorous diet compared to a vegetarian version. So I think it's a, it's a really good question and a universal precaution. RCTs, as valuable as they are, and again, I've made my career for the last 20 years running them, they are subject to the bias of the investigator, and they only ever ans answer the question you ask. And if you want to show that an omnivorous diet is bad, can you design into your study a bad omnivorous diet as the comparison? Absolutely. So you really have to look very carefully at that. And, and again, I think what it means is 
look at a diversity of methods, look carefully at the details of studies, and only base your conclusions on the overall weight of evidence, which is what I've tried to do throughout my career. Uh, any comment from you, Nina? No, no, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think that you know, when you flash through that number of clinical trials without anybody being able to read them or undersee them, there's no way we can be assured, and you're arguing one side of a, of a, of a, a, a debate, we have no assurance that um, that you actually are curating those clinical trials in a way that would be at all fair. The one clinical trial that you went into any depth on, which was the Ornish trial, we saw quite clearly if upon inspection, it was uh, was not a, a was, did not show what you you had said that it showed. So I think that it's very hard to um, I would I would assume as the audience that it's not necessarily trustworthy that some uh, you know a very a uh, rapid fire list of clinical trials that you've curated was a fair curation. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, yeah, this is also for uh, Dr. Katz. Um, you had actually mentioned the NHANES data that you had looked at a little bit earlier. I was fortunate to actually get a hold of it, and I was especially interested in how those people above 50 seem to have a higher rate of death per year if they had lower LDL relative to those who had higher LDL. In fact, this even includes the centenarians of the NHANES data set, which I found to be quite interesting. Much of the data that you were presenting from earlier have a lot to do with the presumed positive effect size of a vegan diet and how it lowers LDL. Did you have a comment for that? Sure, thank you. So uh, to be clear, you know, and uh, frankly, I can't argue uh, about the rapid fire presentation of clinical trials. M the resolution is about the existence of evidence. I had to show that there's a bounty of evidence, and I wish there had been more time to go into detail. And routinely I do that, but that's not what tonight allows for. A reduction in LDL with these plant-based diets was just one of many effects all of them lined up in a direction that's favorable. And by the way, it's now widely accepted in the cardiovascular community that if you lower LDL, which is what all of the prescription drugs approved by the FDA for the treatment of dyslipidemia and coronary disease do, that what happens to HDL isn't important. If you get LDL low enough, HDL ceases to be a meaningful predictor at all. Um, but my answer to your question is reverse causality. Uh, we actually published a paper many years ago about the unreliability of cholesterol levels when we admitted patients to the hospital because it always plummets. So if people have chronic disease, if you look at mortality and lower LDL, the question is, was there the presence of a chronic disease accounting for the incipient mortality risk and their LDL was falling because of the presence of chronic disease. There's a really, it's, a, it's an arduous thing to do in epidemiologic studies to control for that window where you're subject to reverse causality because actually people's LDL is falling because they're sick. So it's not that the low LDL is causally increasing their risk of dying, it's that they're increased risk of dying because bad stuff's happening inside their body and it causes their lipid levels to fall. That's pretty well known. Uh, comment from you, Nina? Yeah. yeah, I would just say that LDL lowering through drugs is is very different than has it, LDL lowering through diet has never been consistently shown to be related to cardiovascular outcomes. What you do with a drug and what happens with drugs has not been confirmed in diets. So the LDL question, if your doctor's putting you on a diet to lower your LDL and he's putting you on a drug to lower your LDL, the diet, lowering LDL through diet is not well correlated with your cardiovascular outcomes. HDL is in fact much better correlated with your positive cardiovascular outcomes in diet. Okay, um, I'm, I, one, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, take it away please, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, David Cass. That was a, a great presentation. I've been a big fan of yours, and as someone who's read a oh, lot. Oh, would you please ask the question? <laughs> uh, you pointed out many conflicts you, of interest, uh, many conflicts of interest amongst the, the vegan authors and the biases associated with that. But I've noticed that you're not a physician you're like yourself, like David Katz, who spent a lifetime trying to you're talking uh, be in the science. Uh, so do you mind just explaining your financial conflicts of interest, like where the money from your books are sold go to and your speaking engagements and things like that? Yeah, I mean, conflicts of interest is a super important topic. I, um, I do not receive any money from industry. Uh, like David Katz, I give speeches, and I give speeches to all kinds of groups. And 
um, I just give the same speech to everyone. If 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 tomorrow the diet the U.S. government were to decide to uh, to endorse a diet higher in in meat and dairy, uh, I wouldn't make a single penny. Um, I I don't I don't okay. profit from. Uh, from any industry, and I'm not tied. I don't have shares in any company. I will say it is very distinct from David Katz, who um, who is not only is a CEO and um, and founder of a plant-based diet company, and has a long list of companies in which he is um, paid for scientific advisors. He received more than seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars from Hershey. He's received more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from Quaker Oats. He's given testimony to defend um, Chobani, the high sugar content of Chobani yogurt at his standard rate of $3,500 an hour. I mean, th there is a huge number of companies in which he is involved and invested. And I will say that I'm not involved in any company or get money from any industry. Oops. Oops. Um, uh, da da David, do you want to respond? No? Yes? Up to you. I don't think that's true. Um, I, I've actually read a refutation of that in Politico that kind of followed the money trail related to the beef industry and the dairy industry. So I, I think most of what we just heard is untrue. Um, uh, we'd but, have to correct that. It does not say, it says I sat in a room and there was somebody in the room from the Cattlemen's oh, Association. Does she get to and that is not an okay. indication but, that I put, work for them. Put that in your summary. Uh, but, okay, you finish your remark, uh, David. And, uh, Thanks. But you can come. Yeah, so um, actually I, I've not received money from these food companies. We've done funded studies and actually all its testimony to, I, first of all, if you are constitutionally opposed to industry funded research, you would go into a pharmacy, there'd be nothing on the shelves you do realize that almost all drug research is industry funded. So the issue is the quality of the research, the nature of the contract. So my lab over the years has had funding from a number of food companies, including a number from the Egg Nutrition Center. And as you can hear, I'm arguing tonight against routine consumption of eggs, but we published a series of studies that found no harm of eggs, including in folks with coronary artery disease. The results are the results. You, you don't get to choose. So we did an intervention study. We used endothelial function as the primary outcome. So in, in every case where we've had funding in our lab, whether it's NIH, CDC, USDA, industry, foundations, we've had a hypothesis. We've tested it in as unbiased a manner as possible. We produced the results. And uh, you know, as for the rest, I, uh, I'm not CEO of a company that has anything specific to do with plant-based nutrition. Um, I do engage in a number of professional activities that are related to things I believe are important. And, you know, and I think we have to be careful uh, at, about hitting one another over the head with this idea of conflict of interest. What it makes me think of is um, there was a time when a, a group of Republican senators called out Al Gore for having investments in the green economy. And Gore said, yeah, and, and the, the, the idea was he was advocating for these companies because he had investments. And he said, no, I was advocating for these companies and then I invested in them because I thought we're supposed to put our money and our effort and our time and our passion where our convictions are. Well, okay. About the same. All right, thanks. Um, time for the summaries. Nina, uh, US summation. Um, yeah, I just want to, can you pull up slides 90 and 91? You know, I, I definitely agree that it's great to put your, uh, your money in things that you believe in, but when you do that to a great extent, um, you are, you know, and these are some of your conflicts of interest here, that um, when, when you do that, it really becomes, it's very hard then to uh, be a credible source for being objective. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to say, well, my, my opinion comes from my financial benefit or that I might, that I might reap um, or, or that it comes from my genuine evaluation of the literature, which is why, although I have been offered numerous um, jobs as scientific advisors and, and shares in companies that I know will do very well, um, I've, I've rejected them all because I don't want to ever have that kind of conflict of interest. Um, you know, I, I think that this is a kind of a nice segue into, like you, you're, an you're uh, the founder or, or have been deeply involved in this supplements company, and I think that's a kind of a nice, um, and I just want to say that, you know, the other things in which you've denied are all on your CV, so anybody, which is on your website, so anybody who wants to go and look at these numbers about how much money you've received from various places, 
um, can look on your CV. That's where I got them. Um, so I would just like to do my summation. I think this point about s vitamins and supplements is a really important one. Um, well, first let me just talk about the, the, the clinical, tr whether there has been little or, or no rigorous evidence that has been presented. I would still argue that despite those incredibly long summary of, of clinical trials at the beginning, because we were able to scrutinize none of them, and because other bodies scrutinizing this body these clinical trial data have not found them to rise to the level of being able to endorse them to prevent diabetes, to prevent heart disease, to, uh, to be included in the dietary guidelines despite a bias for plant-based diets. Those bodies did not deem those trials to be rigorous enough. Um, this idea that we can then rely on epidemiological evidence because the clinical trials do not tell us everything that we want to know um, is still just, I think, a failed concept. You know, it's this idea that it, it, it is hard to, yes, it is hard to do, um, to, to design an airplane, but if that's hard, but, but if you fail in that, it doesn't mean that um, magic carpets fly. You know, it just means that clinical trials are hard to do. They are hard to do, but they've been done in the past and they can be done again, and they are the only way that you can show cause and effect. And again, you cannot, it's the tragic, uh, the tragedies of the past where we have seen that we have relied upon epidemiological evidence and gone forward with policies that turn out to be wrong. Again, many women lost to hormone replacement therapy, people who gave up on eating egg yolks uh, and, and missed out on needed nutrients. And I think the last thing that I just want to say, do you have my summation slides, my conclusion slides? Oh, okay. So I just want to say, um, so again, just going back to this pyramid of evidence, we have not seen uh, randomized controlled trials in a way that we can speculate, that we can understand them and actually evaluate them and understand that they're viable. We've only seen observational studies from you. Um, and again, this idea that a, a vegetarian or vegan diet could even be viable to sustain human life. These are some of the nutrients that you need to get in order to survive. Um, and maybe one of the reasons you're you know, a, a, an investor or, or an owner of a, veg a supplement company is that you, on a vegan or vegetarian diet, you must take supplements. You must especially take B12, which does not exist in plant foods. And many, many nutrients and supplements uh, new minerals and vitamins that are essential for life are either not available in plant foods or they're in their less bioavailable form. I think iron is a really good example of that. You cannot get from spinach what you get from meat. Um, and that's true in many ways. Lack of vitamin B12 is extremely da dangerous and leads to birth defects. Um, so I think that that is just a critical flaw when you're saying let's assume a vegan vegetarian diet, which we've only had access to that the last 20 to 30, 40 years, is something that we can rely upon for the whole human race. Um, when it doesn't supply the basic nutrients needed for human life, that is a very difficult argument to believe. Um, and then again, there are these anti-nutrients in plant. I think a question you kind of brushed off, but they're very real. They decrease the absorption of iron, protein, iodine, iron, zinc, magnesium, and, and, and all kinds of, um, so it makes it less possible. There are many people who cannot eat these plant foods. Also, you cannot get the long chain omega-3 fatty acids from plant foods. Um, flax seed oil won't do it. So you cannot get those essential nutrients that you need for life from plant foods. Um, so I will just say, you know, you've spoken a lot about your, um, your authority in the field and all the trials that you've done, and, you know, one thing I would say is, um, it's true you've done a lot of this research, um, but it does, it's like a sports, uh, the, there are people who can write about sports, and they know a lot more about the sports than the baseball players themselves who are out on the field doing it. Um, but, you know, it's a fallacy to appeal to authority. It doesn't matter who is right, it matters what is right. Conclusion. While I'm, thank you, Brett. Uh, so while waiting for the slides to be up here, um, actually, folks, uh, first of all, you can know something is true without an RCT. Uh, but what I presented to you is a lot of RCTs. But uh, I want to point out something else that was omitted tonight. Actually, avoidance of hormone therapy because of two RCTs, the Women's Health Initiative and the HERS trial has resulted in an estimated 90,000 premature deaths in women in this country because the data were misrepresented. 
It was a very small increased risk in some women, not in others, and we've actually scared women who would benefit, even in terms of survival, away. And the correction comes from observational epidemiology. We need multiple sources of evidence. Um, and by the way, you didn't hear me talk about nutrient supplements here this evening, right? So uh, not really relevant to the resolution. Uh, this really is my view in, um, in common with Michael Pollan. Diets are better when they're real food, mostly plants. Uh, when I reviewed this topic uh, for annual review of public health, this was the conclusion that I reached. Um, we were specifically told tonight to talk just about human health effects. What is the real argument for, say, vegan diets? Is it human health effects? No, I, I don't know that an optimal vegan diet is better for human health than an optimal Mediterranean diet. I think they're pretty comparable. Frankly, they're both massively better than the typical American diet, which is the seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. But if we look at the trifecta of more years in life, more life in years, human health, ethics, and environmental impact, which we were told not to talk about this evening, that actually makes an extremely powerful case for plant predominant to even plant exclusive diets. And frankly, this is really important because we are destroying biodiversity on our planet, we are changing the climate, and all of this we were asked not to talk about. So I'm not talking about it. Except to tell you that for a physician not to talk about it is incredibly irresponsible because there are no healthy people on a ravaged planet. And so frankly, the impact of our diets at scale on planetary health, if you don't think of that as part of your health, you are misguided. And that was the basic conclusion recently of the Eat Lancet Commission report. And by the way, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in 2015 explicitly recommended limiting meat intake and eating more plants and included a vegetarian recommendation based on their review of the literature. It was the politicians under lobbying from the beef and dairy industry that expunged that from the official dietary guidelines. But this and only this really is what we were asked to debate here this evening. A debate is either about a resolution or it's not. So if we can change the topic mid-debate, I'm not sure what I signed up for, but I accepted an invitation to debate this issue. There is little or no rigorous evidence. And I think actually both parties agreed that multiple randomized controlled trials constitute rigorous evidence. Meta-analyses of those trials constitute rigorous evidence. So yes, you haven't had a chance to read all those papers, so there's a bit of a he said, she said, but how was that going to be otherwise unless you became content experts here this evening? I presented just a smattering of the relevant evidence, but I think it's more than enough to show that no evidence is demonstrably wrong. There's obviously a lot of evidence. Now you could debate whether every one of those trials is completely reliable or not, but little evidence is also wrong. Or is it all good evidence? Do you like those studies? Do you like the authors? Well, you folks can take your time and figure that out, but there's a shit whack of evidence. That's a simple fact. And since the evidence I presented was preferentially randomized control trials, meta-analyses, and systematic reviews, which everyone agrees are at the pinnacle of types of evidence, even though, frankly, I think other forms of evidence are extremely reliable, the resolution is wrong. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Well, that, uh, that concludes uh, and, uh, the, uh, the evening's debate. And uh, uh, Jane, you're opening the voting for the closing vote. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I hope you uh, enjoy this evening and that you can come uh, next month uh, uh, in June. Uh, the, that uh, next month, very different resolution, rather dry sounding, uh, defended by Professor Teresa Gerolducci of the New School, uh, will defend the resolution. The social security system can't add to the federal deficit, cannot add to the federal deficit. Uh, and. Uh, Taking the negative will be me. Um, and um, so I will be debating uh, Professor Teresa Gilducci, and uh, guest moderator will be Nick Gillespie. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, and that will be uh, June 17th. Now, events for which we suggest you buy ticks right away because uh, we're selling out will be uh, August 12th. Uh, the Cato Institute's George Selgin will defend the resolution Bitcoin is 
poorly suited to the purpose of becoming any nation's main medium of exchange. Opposing him will be Safadian Amus, author of the Bitcoin Standard, the decentralized alternative to central banking. On Tuesday, September 10th, uh, part of the Problem podcast host, Dave Smith, the very guy who does our warm-up acts each month, will be a debater. Defending the resolution, the Libertarian Party should never again put up national candidates whose views are similar to those of Gary Johnson and Bill Weld <laughs> against Nicholas Sarwark, chair of the Libertarian National Committee. Dave, uh, uh, a newly uh, a dad, is going to double dip that evening. He's going to be earning a fee as our debater. He will also be doing the warm-up act and uh, that evening. So that's going to be a double dip from Dave. And uh, Nick Sarwalk has agreed to that deal. So there's no problem from Nick. People agree in advance, Dr. Katz, when they count to the wording and everything else, which you did. You agreed never to speak of what? What didn't you speak of? Yeah, you you agreed never to speak of the environment. Anyway, those those other things that you agreed never to speak about, because they're not real. Anyway, and also uh, the uh, the uh, university uh, no, t Tuesday, November fifth, another event actually, which is going to involve me once again. Um, uh, emeritus Professor uh, uh, Richard Wolf will be defending the resolution, Socialism is Preferable to Capitalism as an Economic System that Promotes Freedom, Equality, and Prosperity. He will be defending that resolution. Again, in that case, opposing him will be me. Uh, and uh, this time, I promise not to lose my temper. Uh, those. Those who uh, viewed my debate with Bhaskar, occasionally Sankara on socialism, occasionally uh, admonished me, don't lose your temper again. In, in fact, it turns out that I've been told that that debate I did with Bhaskar as a Reason podcast has had more viewings than any other Reason podcast in history. I guess a lot of people wanted to see me lose my temper, it turned out. <laughs> but, but, but it's not going to happen again, not when I debate uh, Professor uh, Richard Wolf. I want to guarantee you of that. Now, as a bonus, other good stuff coming up. Uh, the SOA Forum will take to the seas from July 5th to 12th. Jane, I think you're looking at me, and I think you have the final uh, vote. You can close the voting. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> the, the there'll be a Contra Cruise uh, hosted by Tom Woods and Bob Murphy. I'll be moderating a SOA Forum debate on the Contra Cruise to Alaska uh, starting July 5th uh, to, through 12th. Uh, pacifist society is morally and practically superior to one using defensive violence. It's going to be a defensive pacifism with uh, Bob Murphy taking the affirmative against Tom Woods. I'll be uh, moderating that resolution. I'll be doing some other presentations on board uh, this trip to Alaska accompanied by my wife. I hope you can all come. I got you all a promo code if you go into Contra Cruise. If you put, just put in Soho, you can get $100 off the Contra Cruise, and I'll be on board. So this could be fun. Uh, all right, now we uh, we have the final vote, and uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, thank you. Um, voting, voting yes on the resolution. Uh, initially, 52% uh, voted yes on the resolution. That went up to 57%. So that was a five percentage point increase. Uh, so that 5% is the number to beat. Uh, voting no on the resolution was 16%. That went up to 29%, picked up 13 percentage points. So the Tootsie Roll goes to Dr. Katz. Yeah.